From the Microsoft Technology Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, this is Tech Connection Live. Brought to you by Component One Ultimate. Download your free trial at componentone.com slash ultimate. Up next, Working with Cloud Identity by Mike Benkovich, MSDN Evangelist. Well, I want to welcome you all to this is the last session. Yeah, you stuck around, you know, it's just between me and whatever before. It's a Friday, it's beautiful outside. We've got the curtains drowned, so it's, it's blacked out, you can't tell. Um, it's actually really raining out there, it's horrible, there's a uh, hurricane coming. So you're lucky to be in here in this session talking about identity. Um, this is part of a series of uh, content that I've, de I've developed and delivered over the last uh, year called Cloud Computing Soup to Nuts. And it's talking about the identity conversation and really trying to understand, you know, is it something that's important to you? What is it? Why do I care? Um, I like to call it identity in the cloud, right? Pardon the pun. Um, but seriously, when you think about security and start trying to talk to developers and talk to people about how important is identity, you know, it's almost like talking about, you know, dental flossing. You know, is it important to floss? You know, it's like that oral hygiene is important. You live longer. You know, it's, it's a good, important thing, but, you know, getting people excited about it is a challenge. But what we, ha what we are excited about is trying to understand the whole security thing. Is that really an issue? Is that something that's a, that's a problem? Something that you care about? Well, as someone who's been you know, living in the Twin Cities for a while and having been active in um, you know, different kind of community things, I've been giving blood for a while. I don't know how many people have given blood before, but they recently had a laptop stolen or something like that. And it was one of those deals where I was kind of concerned because you know, there's information that's out there possibly. So I went to, uh, the, after the, that happened, I went and gave blood and I was kind of curious, you know, what's going on and, you know, what have they done to tighten up this whole security thing and, and the whole question of identity. And uh, they have all these questions they ask you when you give blood. They, they say, you know, have you ever been to this country? Have you ever traveled to this place? Have you ever, you know, done all these different things? And, you know, usually those questions are pretty easy to answer. It's like, no, 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 no. You, after a while, you get to know all the questions, and it's like, okay, I can whip through this in about five seconds, but the nurse has to read them to you. You know, there's some kind of embarrassing questions in there, and it's like, okay. And she can't just skip through them. She's got to read all, all the way through. Well, after this issue with the laptop, they decided to take privacy and as, as an important thing. And so what they did was they created a software program that would read the questions to you and then enable the buttons yes or no after the question was completely read. And she handed me the laptop and walked out of the room. Now, being a computer guy, being somewhat annoyed, you know, it's like I really don't like waiting around for this and I was like waiting for this and the stupid buttons wouldn't get enabled. Um, so I did a right click on the little start menu and it said explore all users. Now, what does that mean? Yes, I'm logged on as admin. So while the questions are being read, I'm navigating through the file system and I find where the application, where the data file is. I plug in my thumb drive, I copy it on my thumb drive. I go home and I call their support number and I say, who should I mail your database to? Does that scare you? It was access, I mean, and it was encrypted, right? Yeah. <laughs> is identity important? Should we really care? The answer is we do. We care about identity. We, it, it, the challenge is how do we build software that works with identity in a way that we are not liable for all of that information for what could happen should someone, you know, some exploit somehow figure out how to, how to use that identity. So when we go out and we create applications and, and whatever, we'll talk today about what Access Control Services is, how it allows us to take advantage of identity from the cloud in a way that we can really apply it and use it inside of our applications very quickly and easily. Um, going out, configuring it, setting it up, and going through using that is what we're going to cover today. We're going to use the cloud. We're going to use the public cloud. Windows Azure has a collection of services out there. Um, we've got compute, storage, and database, but you don't have to use any of that to use our identity service, which is access control services. Recently, it's been named as Windows Azure Active Directory with ACS, ACS being the active, or access control services. What you want to know is, that, is what it is and how it works and how it fits into that picture of software we're going to go out and build. 
So you have the, cl the classic question of how can I come up with a good example of where you use identity. Suppose, it's Friday, after this we get done, we go out to an establishment and we want to order you know, certain beverages, they ask you for an ID, right? So you pull out your library card and you flip it down, are they going to serve me? Absolutely. That's right. Nobody under the age of 21 is using a library anymore, they're all on the internet. <laughs> I love that. I hadn't heard that one. So no one under 21 would be using the library. <laughs> but is this a valid identity, ID card? Yes. Does it have the claims I need to be able to prove that I'm of age? No. And the reason why is because we're talking about something called claims-based identity, which is where we want to have some sort of an identity provider giving us some token that we can turn around and show to be able to go in and use for proving those purposes, right? So, you know, if I can't use this, yeah, I could try to find the doctor who delivered me. Might be a little bit hard anymore. Raising the dead anyway. But what you could do is you could go out and I could pull out my driver's license, right? I've got a driver's license from Minnesota. If I'm in Salt Lake City, do I need a Salt Lake City driver's license? No, why? Because the Salt Lake City people will trust the identity provider of the Minnesota driver's license, it's a recognized identity. It has things that are on there that only, you know, that, that are tamper resistant, like pictures, and they might have other pieces of information that they can say, okay, well, what's, what's your birth date, and, you know, and read it. Um, there's things that they can do to validate that you are who you say you are. In the same way that we can go into a facility and do that kind of a thing, when you go to the airport, you've got the same kind of a service going on, right? So if I want to get on an airplane, I walk in, TSA might do the full body, whatever, and they'll also ask you for an identity. And when they do that, I'm, I'm going through a service that's available at the airport that's not working for the airport. These aren't airport employees. These are people that are a third party. They're contracted to all the airports. Why? Because they can provide a consistent application of those rules that make that identity Thing happen, that whole identity conversation. So if there's new things that they have to do, they go off to training and then they come in, they work for that service. Same thing if I go into you know, a, some uh, sports bar that's got a live band, they might have a bouncer that works for the band and will take care of verifying that everyone is of age or whatever. Sometimes when you go into like an amusement park or they might give you like a little band saying, okay, well, you've been past our security guard, so now you have access and you can leave and come back in. What that token that they give you of that band might have attached to it additional pieces of claims, like you might have access to different parts of the amusement park that you, know, you have to pay extra for or whatever. But that token, that band, is almost like, in the identity world, a token that I could get back from that service that works for me. So inside of Windows Azure, we're talking about identity and we're talking about how can we go out and use those existing pools of identity to do our conversation on security. So you think about this, identity in the cloud can be kind of hard because we've got you know, how to, a number of different ways to go out and create these different pieces of information. If I create a login page and maintain that password and your username and all that and I have to reset your password, all of a sudden if that was ever to be exploited somehow, I would be liable for that stuff being out there. Plus, people would have to remember just one more password. Wouldn't it be great if they could go ahead and log in using a common set of identity? What I've done is, first of all, is I've got a, a website. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it before. It's called BencoTips.com. And on BencoTips.com, I have a uh, some, some special things that you can go out and do. So for instance, I can go over to office hours and I can see that I've got you know, questions that come in, I've got uh, different aspects of the site. But one of the things that I'd like to do is I'd like people to be able to log in to do downloads. And so what I've got is I have a login screen that gives me some public identity providers and options for people to be able to go out and authenticate logging in. So I could go and say, okay, well, how do you want to log in? Well, I'll log in with my live ID. If I go to Live ID, it actually takes me to that login page. I can put in my ID and say my password, if I can remember the password, and click Sign In. 
and now I'm logged into this environment, right? I've got a couple claims that are attached to this token. So for instance, I've got my name identifier, I've got my role name, live ID, I've got the actual name that was copied over. Um, but I'm not tied just to that. I could also click on log out and I could log in with a different ID. So for instance, if I log in with my Google account, first of all, I have to go out to Google and actually provide them with my ID. So see if I can type this in right. Half the time it puts up that capture thing. So let's see if we can get past this. Ah, looks like we're going through. So at this point now, it's gone ahead and it's pulled back an identity that I created with Google. So from Google, I can come down, I can say, guess what? I'm actually an administrator through Google, this account is, and I have an admin menu that I can actually go out and I can see office hours and other administrative tasks I might wanna do inside of my site. I can log out, I could log in again with other options, Facebook, Yahoo. Each of these different providers requires at least a thousand hours of work to implement. Just kidding, no, actually it's a checkbox. It's very easy to go out and take advantage of this. But you know, the, the thing is, is that you've got identity working through the web applications. What about devices? What about if you have a, like say, this is a Windows phone. Ah, look at that, it's an emulator. And I've got a game on here called Rock, Paper, Azure. If you play the game Rock, Paper, Azure on Windows Phone, first thing it's gonna do is check to see if you have an identity associated with your account, and if you uh, haven't already logged in, it's gonna prompt you with the same login options that you get on Benko Tips. Facebook, Live ID, Yahoo, if I click on the Live ID, it'll actually take me to the Live ID login screen. So then I can put in my credentials here, and I could sign in, or I could go out and I could do the same sign in through uh, Google or whatever. But the idea is that to go out and use an existing provider of identity is a lot easier, it's more secure in the sense that I no longer am going to be liable for making sure you know your password. I'm going to trust some, sense, some identity provider out there. So instead of saying I'm going to go out and be my own licensed bureau and give out licenses and membership clubs for everyone coming into my thing, I'm going to take public identity, or I might take corporate identity. I might go out and say, you know what, in order for you to log in, you have to be an employee at Microsoft, in which case you have to provide that ADFS, the Active Directory Federated Services piece of identity to come in and work with this. So let's, let's just step, up, step back to what, what it is we're trying to do. Identity in the cloud is kind of hard because you have a lot of different ways that identity can come in, but fortunately, access control makes it a lot easier. We're working with claims-based identity, which means that different identity providers have different claims attached to the tokens that come in. Um, the identity provider, you can have a variety of different identity providers, including yourself. You could be your own identity provider if you have an Active Directory that you want to tie into. Anything that supports OpenID can be plugged into access control services. The identity selector is the interface that we use to be able to go out and pick the identity that we want to use when we connect up to the site. Um, Access control is also standards-based. It's built on top of OAuth and OpenID. Um, we spent a lot of time with the Windows, in the Windows Foundation uh, creating that to fit with what the industry is doing for uh, working with identity. And we want to make it something that you can go out and get started right away. Um, the way the, the sequence works when I'm going out and making a call from the web is that you have a browser who, that you, some user wants to go out and use your application, but they're trying to get to data that should be in a secure location. So the application, recognizing that you're going to a secure spot, says you need a token, that token, that bracelet, you need to have a token to be able to get into this room. So it goes back and says you don't have the token, but you, these are the valid identity providers that we will let you come in with and the rules that we require to be uh, fulfilled so we can authorize your access. Login does the authentication, so we get our token from Google, Facebook, Live ID, whatever. We turn around, we give that to the bouncer, ACS, Access Control Services, who then says, yeah, that's a valid token. Yes, here's the rules. Okay, I'm gonna take the claims, I'm going to re, re um, I'm gonna digest them down into the claims in the format that the application, the relying party application requires to be able to go out and work with it. So we get that relying party token back and uh, to the browser and then they can go out and they can use the application and do what they need to do. 
So, what do we need to get started with this? Well, we need a valid Azure subscription. First of all, how much does it cost to work with Access Control Services? Sometimes, think, some, sometimes you think it's a pretty expensive thing. It's actually uh, free until November. We're in a preview mode, so everything up until then is going to be free. When you get to November, we start charging it. We'll charge, I, I believe it's $2 for 100,000 transactions, which if you're writing a little you know, mobile game app, that's a high class problem when you have to spend that next $2. And do I require the use of the compute storage or any of those other things? The answer is no. All you need is a valid subscription. So where can you get a subscription? Go out to uh, bencotips.com and, and click on the link to try do the Azure trial. Um, I'll show you where that is. And let's go to the home page. How many people have an active Azure subscription in the room? Five or six. How many people have an MSDN subscription? Quite a few. If you have an MSDN subscription, you have Azure benefits. If you don't, the other half of us, if you want to try Azure, click the Azure free trial. What this link here does is this is actually going to take you to a link down here called aka.ms slash Azure trial MB. And that MB refers to Mike Bankovich, that guy who's supposed to be doing this presentation. He gets a credit when you click through on it. So you know, just go ahead and click on that link. It'll take you over. My boss will love that. Um, and then when you get to that, you can go ahead and create a subscription. So to create a subscription, uh, just click on the Try It Free Offer. And what this does is it'll take you through a series of steps where it'll ask you for a phone number, a, a cell phone, so it can send you a text you a message that has an, a valid, an activation code. So it's very, very quickly it'll go out and do that activation. Um, once it does that, then I can put in a, a, it requires a credit card to do the actual uh, creating of the account. And the only reason why is it does two things. One is it verifies that you are a real person. And two, if you, if you remove the cap, then it knows how to convert it to a pay-as-you-go and it'll use that credit uh, information. Um, the account yourself, or the account that you actually end up creating, um, this account that I'm logged in here with right now has a couple of them. I've got a free trial that's good for another 54 days. Um, if I go out and I click on the uh, upgrade now, this will actually allow me to remove the cap, which then would say, okay, convert it to a pay-as-you-go, at which point then I would be doing that. Um, I'm not ready to upgrade yet. Um, but I also have the MSDN subscription benefits that I've activated. So you can see them all right here. I can even see how much usage I've got uh, through this account uh, since I've created it. So you get, you get some pretty good visibility into what's going on. But the thing is, is once I have a valid subscription, I can click on the Manage tab, and the Manage is going to take me over to the windows.azure.com Windows site, which is where we've got a Silverlight portal that lets you see what's going on with all of your Azure subscription pieces of information. All the services that the cloud offers, compute storage, database, et cetera, are all managed from this portal. So from here, what you'll find is that I've got a, uh, a couple parts of this platform that are interesting. One is a context-sensitive ribbon. This will allow me to see what kinds of tasks I can do when I'm selected different things inside the site. On the far right, I have more, just general information about what this is. And then down on the lower left, I have the information to each of the different aspects of the services. So hosted services, database, synchronization, reports, service bus, access control and caching, and then the virtual network. The one that we're interested in is going to be the service bus and access control. And what I'm going to do is I can click down here and I can go out and I can create a access control service by uh, clicking through here and then saying create a new service. So select the services, give it a namespace. And what this is, is this is an actual WCF RESTful service that will handle that conversation for me. And so I need to have a unique uh, name inside of the DNS land that will uniquely identify it to my account. So I could go out here, I could say tech demo 12, check my availability of that. It is available, so then I can come down here and I can say, we'll set this up for North Central, attach it to this subscription, my three months trial, and then click on create namespace. That easily, I've gone ahead and created a, a service namespace that'll be able to go out and do things for me. So I 
it takes about two minutes for it to activate. So if you were to go ahead and do this and then do some other things and come back, you'd find that then it'd be activated. I already created one called My Tech Demo. I just created that a few minutes before we started. And what you'll find is that the management endpoint down here is the, the URI that I can go to if I wanted to just browse out to it, I could see all of the information I need. So if I was to take this and just say copy and browse my way up to a new tab and paste that in and press return, you'll see that my tech demo.accesscontrol.windows.net is the management portal for this. It even has instructions on how to get started on configuring it. So let's talk about that. What do we have to do? We create our namespace. We use windows.azure.com to uh, manage all of the services we're running. It gives us that namespace.accesscontrol.windows.net. Um, then we go out and we specify what identity providers we want our application to work with. You know, do you want to work with Google? Do you want to work with Yahoo? Do you want to work with Live ID? Do you want to work with Facebook? Do you have Active Directory? Do you have uh, some other open ID provider that you want to work with? So you select the trusted identity providers, and you, and you can do that by going through that uh, management portal. And then you specify how your application is going to run. Now, the same way that a restaurant has a particular address that they're running in, your application has a particular address. If I take that bracelet, and I got it at, you know, at, at um, Great America, and I go up to, uh, what, what, what's the, if I go to Valley Fair, and I've got the Great America token, that token's only valid at Great America. It's not valid at um, Valley Fair. I have to get a Valley Fair token from the bouncer that's working there. So you have to specify where your realm of your application is. That's your URI. We, we can use that as the HTTP location that the application is running on. We specify the format that we want to work with for our token. Are we working with SAML, the security application markup language? Do we want to work with a simple web token? You know, what is that format going to look like? And then we specify how we're going to handle the, the return process after you've done the login. Where do you come back to? And then finally, we define out our claims processing rules. And this is where we say, what claims on that source token do we want to flow through to the token that we're going to give back to the application? And that's where I can do interesting things like adding different roles or adding different claims that you know, somehow fit whatever logic I need. So let's go out and we're going to take this and we're going to configure up our service. So I've got my, uh, I'm out here on our tech, my tech demo.accesscontrol.windows.net. When I click on the identity providers, it's going to show me that I have Windows Live ID already by default enabled for it. And these are just the providers that I recognize. I don't have to use them in my application, but I can go out and define which ones are, are going to be out there. I'm going to add Google because that's an easy one. When you click on Next, Google has a link text, Google Me or whatever. I could put an image URL if I have an icon I want to use for it. And when I click on Save, it's now been added to my list of providers. Now, working from home and your contractor, that took about two weeks. OK, I'm just kidding. I'm just trying to offer helpful suggestions. We can also add Yahoo. Um, you know, and this might be a public-facing application. Um, what I've got out here, let me just show you what I've got, is I have an application that I created. I think, and I called this thing techdemo12.cloudapp.net. And this is where our application is, is running right now today. I actually went out and created this. I took a, an existing application, my site, and I did a deployment. So I right clicked, added a web deployment project, and I pushed it up into the cloud. And so my Tech Connection app is, should be up there running. And there it is. You can see this is sitting out here. I've got my home page. I've got my about page, I've got my presenter page, and then I can go out and I can edit and make changes to presenters. Trouble is, I want to secure this because guess what? I'm not logged in, right? So we need to do something about this. The key is I've got this URI where this application is running, which is going to be the name of, of, of the realm of where I'm going to be running my application from. So let's go back over here to our identity provider. Let's go ahead and finish this. We'll save our identity providers. Um, if you, how many people have done Facebook development? Anyone? They, they went public recently. 
I don't know if you noticed, it's a great place to be. So you can go out and you can do some Facebook application integration. So I can use Facebook. If you do Facebook development, they do have this thing called an application ID and an application secret they will provide you. You also need to specify that that application recognizes the realm that the application request is coming from if you want to get information back and forth from it. It does work. It's a little bit more to set up. Um, I'm not going to do that right now. Um, I could also add, a if you have corporate security, if you have a corporate identity, um, I could be using an Active Directory uh, Federation, uh, WS Federation provider. And what this is, is if you have my corporate identity, ADFS allows me to, to have that conversation, specify claims I want to send through that token service, um, and I specify the URL where that is. Or if the uh, administrator gives you a file that you can load, you can just go out and upload that file. When this is actually running, it would need access to the URL where that thing lives. Uh, but you can go ahead and configure that and set it up just, as, just the same way you did with the other stuff. So now we've got our identity providers as being Google, LiveID, and Yahoo. We're going to go out and define our relying party application. And this is our website. So we'll add the relying party application. We're going to add in here, we're going to say this is uh, my tech demo site site, there we go, and I've got the URI where that's running. I can paste that in. Now, a lot of times, most times, you should be using an HTTPS. I'm doing this as a demo, so I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and use just an HTTP, just because I don't want to mess around with the certificate at this point. Um, once I've done that, I'm also going to paste in a secure location, or a, a your logged in page. So it will return back to wherever I want it to go. Next, I can pick out the token format. So I've got SAML uh, 2.0, 1.0, and simple web tokens. Uh, for purposes of a web app, we'll leave it as SAML 2. And I'm just going to go ahead and just accept the uh, default values for the rest of, the, of these things. But what I've done is I've now created a line party application that will use this service and be able to have the conversation. But I still need to define the rules for how I want to take the claims that come in from the source identity provider tokens and put them into my relying party output token. So we're going to click on our rule groups, and we're going to edit the rules that are created for that. Now, by default, none have been added, but I can generate them using the identity providers I've already selected to take the claims and just create a one-for-one -one mapping of claim coming in, claim going out. Um, nice thing about this is if I add additional uh, claims or providers, it can then go out and auto-generate that for me. Now, one of the things that you might notice is that I'm going to, the different providers have different claims associated with them. If I go to Yahoo, it's going to return back my email as well as a username and a name identifier. Three claims with, with Yahoo, same, same three that Google has. Live ID has only one. It only has the name identifier. Don't ask me why, it's just the way it's been implemented. But a lot of times when I'm working on an application, I want to have like the username come up and I'd like to be able to display something. So if I don't put anything into the name claim, then my live ID, you know, I might be missing some data. So I'm going to add a custom rule to be able to handle that kind of a scenario. So what I'm going to do is if, if the claim identity provider is Google, you'll see I have three claims coming in. If I go to Yahoo, I still have three. If I go to live ID, I have only one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that input claim from Live ID. I'm going to say if you log in with Live ID, and um, regardless of what that input claim value is, I'm going to send out an output claim where I'm going to create an additional claim for name that will contain a value down here, say Live ID user. So I've gone through this list of claims, the valid ones I could push out. I could have selected things like roles. I could put birth dates, surnames, <laughs> thumbprints, all kinds of different things that are part of that, the, the defined schema that are, that are recognized. Um, and then we'll give this a copy or a name here, live ID name claim. And I'll even put the words my so that I know that it's my live ID so that it wasn't generated by the system. So once I do that, now I've got uh, a total of should be six, or should be three, six, seven, eight claims all told. Um, I have a name claim for all three. I have name identifier for all three. I don't have email address. I'm not really going to worry about email address. 
But the idea is that that's all I have to do to configure this for access control services. So how do I use this service then inside of my application? Well, this is where I'm going to need something installed. So when you are looking at the services platform, one of the things you might notice is that when you have services selected up here instead of one of the access, one of these subservices, it has a bunch of links and useful information on the right. One of them is the Windows Identity Foundation SDK. You need to install the tools for the version of Visual Studio you're running. And just to, because Microsoft doesn't know how to count, don't ask me why, um, when you install the SDK 3.5, that's for Visual Studio 2008. And it, when, if you install the tools for 4.0, then it's for uh, the SDK 4.0, that's for Visual Studio 2010. So when you install the tools for the appropriate version of Visual Studio, it'll add the Federation utility to Visual Studio and add the tools and also alter the menu items when you're uh, looking at the solution to be able to add an STS reference. STS stands for uh, Secure Token Service. So the Secure Token Service that's going to serve up our tokens, I'm going to pull from, our, uh, from that environment. So what we'll do is I'm going to come over here to where we've defined out our access control services. And the fourth thing down here, application integration, just click on that development tab down here. And it's going to then take us out to where we can see uh, information about the login pages. So you can configure how the relying party applications work. You're going to figure out how the application works. And then I've got this WS Federation metadata. This is the important piece I need because if I'm going to use a secure token service, it's looking for this link. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this to my clipboard, and I'm going to go back over to our solution, and I'm going to right-click on my site, and I'm going to say add. Before I do this, let me show you one thing that's interesting. Here's my web config. Do you remember how web config used to be kind of this ugly thing? And then 4.0, it got pretty, because if you would do 4.0, it just knows all the other stuff it has to do. Um, anyway, when I go out and I add the STS reference, this is a federation utility that will edit the web config for me and add the pieces I need to work with uh, the Identity Foundation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and put in my application URI, HTTP, and I think I called it techdemo12.cloudapp.net. Click on Next. It's going to notice that I'm not running uh, SSL on this service. It, it gives you a warning, don't do that, because you shouldn't do that. But I, for the demo, I'm just going to ignore it. So do I want to continue? Yes. I'm going to use an existing STS service. So I'm going to paste in, and, and this is going to be my tech demo 12 or my tech demo access control windows net slash federation 2007 6 federation metadata. So you can kind of see where that is. If you click on the test location, this is going to open up a browser window that will actually browse out to that. And so here I can see what this file would look like. Um, if you take a look, this is all the rules of how I've defined my service, the conversation, all that XML that describes out the metadata. Um, so I'm going to click on Next. I'm using that existing STS service, and then I have the option to specify how I want to do chaining and a few other uh, pieces. Click on Next a couple times, and we'll go ahead and click on Finish. And what it's going to do is it's going to add to the web config the pieces that I need. Now I'm going to reload this. You might find this looks a little different. But you notice how our pretty web config now is a big, ugly web config. But it's actually got some sections that are important and are worth uh, spelunking your way through. So first of all, before I do anything else, if I do a control KD, I can just reformat it. Um, I'm going to notice that inside of my system.web down here, that it has added a key thing. It's added an authorization rule saying deny anonymous users. So what that means is that I no longer allow anonymous users to come to this site at all. You browse to this site, you're going to require that you have that token from my bouncer. If you don't have it, I'm going to you'll get redirected to go and get one. Um, the second thing is the authentication mode is set to none. It's not Windows, it's not Forms, it's a third type. And so we thought the name num was a really great name. Just kidding. Um, 
The next pieces that came in is that we have a location path added for Federation metadata. It actually added a directory for this. This is where that XML is, and it's allowing all access to it. Um, and then if you scroll down, you've got some things that were added. One is I've added this Microsoft.identity model. Now, this namespace, this assembly, lives on my developer machine. If I were to use the local host and do my development, I would see it's all going to work. But when I deploy it into the cloud, I have to actually add that assembly to also deploy with it. So if I go over to my references on this particular site, you'll notice it's not here. So I'm going to right click, add a reference, and we'll add Microsoft.identity. Did I spell that right? Microsoft.identity model. And we'll go ahead and add that identity model. Now, not only do I add it here, but I'm also going to have to right click, go to the properties, and say copy local. So when I do a deployment of this, it'll actually push it out to that environment. Now, that will take care of the identity model. And if I come down, I can see here's my identity model. I've got the uh, Federation metadata location. This is where it's going to go out and pull back uh, information about my authentication conversation. I have an issuer. The issuer is who is going to take care of that active redirection of things. Um, key is here, it, well, yeah, yeah. once I've done this, um, it's going to return back when the authentication happens, it's going to return back a token attached to the HTTP request. Now, what happens on a page when it comes through ASP.NET? It's going to do a validation of the page. And that token is longer than what it expects, and it's going to throw an error up for me. Now, I know this because I've deployed it and I've seen it you know, blow up on me. And so what you have to do is you have to actually just on this and disable the either write some code to handle the extra token length and do HTTP write, or you could do a SSL and it would take care of itself. But for our demo, I've got a hack I'm going to add here. Notice it's called hack, working without SSL. And I've got a l reference to the blog, how to get this up and going. Actually, it's worth reading that. Um, but by doing this, I should be able to take our application here. And let's do a little quick deploy. So take my site, right click, and say publish. I'm doing a web deploy because I'm doing development. Um, I'm going to deploy it out to my tech demo 12, put in my password, save the password. And then it's going to take my output, and it's going to republish this and send it out for me. So let's see here. Continue, continue. It's just going to prompt me a few times. Um, but when this is done, if I go out to where we have our tech demo out here, and I click on the home page, remember, it should be re-authenticating for everyone who comes into this site. And as you can see, I'm now out. I've got Google Me up there. I've got my Yahoo. I've got my Live ID. And now I can go ahead and I can do that authentication. Now, if you looked at, what was it, BencoTips.com, and you click on the login, you might notice that it's got a little bit of custom Chrome. It looks a little bit more like it's my site as opposed to just that generic site. It's actually because I wrote a custom login page to support that. Would you be interested to see how to do that? OK, so this is actually pretty easy as well. When you go out to the application integration, I have a tab here called Login Pages. And what I can do is I can, do I can click on the login page for my tech demo sites and download an example of that login page. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my web config. I'm going to say copy full path. I'll, sh I'll show you why in a second. But I'm going to download the example login page. And this page looks exactly like the login page that you saw with no Chrome, just the white boxes. Um, but I can paste this in here. Let's do this. And let's call this mylogin.html. And I'm going to save it to the directory where I've got my project and everything else. So we'll go ahead and close that. If I come over to my project, and I take this and I say, show all files, I'll see here's my login page.html. I can double click on that. I can right click on this and say, include it in the project. And now I've got that custom Chrome. And what it actually is, if you look at the code of it, there's a lot of JavaScript in here. Um, and the JavaScript of, is going through doing things like checking to see is there an identity provider? And for each one of the buttons, how does it look? Do I do them side by side? How do I do the display? 
Um, I ended up spending probably as much time just trying to figure out the CSS and how to lay out something to get my Chrome to show up. Um, you can cut and paste and play around with it, but I mean the key is that you come in here and you say here, my login page has stuff. Click over to my designer, there's my login page has stuff, go out and grab a picture. Not a picture like that, let's go into my styles and let's grab the ABC header. Say okay. And then what I can do is I could say view this in the browser just to see what it looks like. And it's actually going to give an error because right now access is denied to everything on that website, right? So I have to say, do I want to allow anonymous users to come in and then have a secure location within the site? The way that we would do that is, how can you, can you guess? Web config, right. We're going to go and we're going to take out this deny users and we're going to put in a location uh, reference to lock down whatever folder, whatever resources we do want to secure. So I have a thing out here for the secure folder. Let's go ahead and paste that in. And so now anything that is in the secure folder is going to be requiring a token when you go out to look at it. So if I do that now, and I go out and I say view this in the browser, now I should see something that looks a little bit better. And there it is. Okay, you need to spend more time with the Chrome than I did, but the idea is that you've got the opportunity now to go out and configure it and whatever. But we can see this is my custom login site. Now the other thing I'm, I need to do is that in the web config, there's a spot where we specify who is going to handle issuing that token. And right now that issuer is HTTPS, mytechdemo.accesscontrol.windows.net. All I need to do here is change this to be the URI where I've got my site. And that was techdemo12.cloudapp.net slash my login.html. So by doing that now, I could go out and I could say, oops, come over here. Arr. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. There we go. And say publish. And say publish. And if we did this right, publish is getting pushed out. There it is. It's all done. And now if I go out to my tech demo site, or tech demo dot twelve, or tech, what is it tech demo? There we go. Now I should be able to have anonymous access to the general part of the site, but when I go out to click on the presenters, well, now you have to actually log in, right? So at this point, then I could go ahead and do the login. I could go ahead to put in my uh, credentials. Um, the first time I come in, it already knows that I'm logged in, but it hasn't given rights. Google hasn't agreed with you that you want to you know, share your information with this third-party site, uh, mytechdemo.accesscontrol.windows.net. So it actually is going to verify that I want to do that. I can remember the approval or not. And, and so then if I allow, then it's going to go out and it'll bring me back in so I can see here's all of the information out there. And then I go to that. So then I need the page under secure. And we'll add this. And I'm going to call this a web form with my master page. We'll call it logged in.aspx. And say OK. And then from here, I can right click and say publish. Do you see how fast and easy this is? I mean, it's. I spend you know, probably 30 minutes explaining it and five minutes writing code. Um, if you're interested in seeing how to do this with other types of clients, um, Joel was talking about you know, the idea of having the different MVVMs, the different views, and you've got, you know, this is the view that runs inside of the, the web. Well, I also have one that would run from inside of the cloud or from a device. So let's go back over here to this and say refresh. I can also do this with other types of applications. So 
let's close this out. Let's go back over here. And suppose you want to do this, like for instance, with devices. Um, if you're doing uh, devices being like phones, anyone doing any mobile development of any type, iPhone, Android, Windows Phone, iPad, Android pads, Windows 8, you know, there's all these different client factors. The thing about ACS is it's a RESTful service, which means that anything that supports HTTP can use this service to go out and work with it. It's making a bunch of RESTful calls that you can wrap up in different SDKs. Now, you can write those calls at a very low level yourself, but we've included some toolkits that have been developed by the uh, Microsoft DPE department or whatever, um, and they've posted them out here uh, for Windows Phone, Android, and iOS. And I'm going to show you how it works with the Windows Phone. Um, I have got two demos, two, two ways, and one is actually doing it the hard way where I actually open up the token and go through it. Um, the other way is using a NuGet package, which will generate code for us. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to just show just the NuGet, but if you want to see how the other one works, there's a webcast that I did on this that you can also go out and see. Um, I'll also stick around in case anyone you know, wants to see what's happening, but I'll explain what, it, what it's doing. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this NuGet thing inside of Visual Studio, which is a package installer. The nice thing about it is I can install a package. I can also uninstall a package, and I can use it inside of my application. Once I do this, then I just need to configure how things are going to work. So first of all, I'm going to configure Access Control Services to understand that I got a new application. So we'll go to Relying Party Applications. We're going to add a new one. We'll call this my phone app. Notice my unique names, really useful. Um, instead of coming from an HTTP location, I'm going to come from a URI. So the URI I would use would be my RPA which happens to be a, uh, just a resource indicator for Rock, Paper, Azure. I was building out a Windows Phone game for a while, um, so I've just gotten in the habit of using that. But I'm just going to use that as the location where this application is running. I'm going to then specify a token format of just a simple web token because I just want a JSON low uh, overhead kind of a call, be able to push information back and forth. And then I'm going to come down and I'm going to say go ahead and generate a token signing key. I would use this if I want to do the encryption and passing information from the client on the, on the device down to, um, to my uh, services running in the cloud or wherever. Um, and then I'll save this. Now I'm also going to go over here. I've got my phone app now. I'm just going to add the rule group for the phone. So I'm going to go down to my phone app and I'm going to say add or generate the rules, generate and I'm going to add our custom name rule. So I've got the name ID for, uh, or name provider for live ID. So go here, grab that, come down. So any type of a claim coming in, I'm going to pass out a name claim saying you are a live ID user. And say OK, save. Oops. Where did I put that? So I'm going to pass this as live ID user. All right. So while I've configured the app. I don't have to go through any other steps here. All I have to do is go out and create an application that can work with this. So let's take our site. You'll see I've got stuff set up here. I'm going to right click on my solution. I'm going to add. If you haven't done Windows Phone development, I'm going to show you very quickly how you can create a phone application. Um, I've installed the Windows Phone SDK and the, the tools for that. Um, the downloads for that, by the way, if you go to Benko Tips, you can download that from over here on the left. I've got the download Azure Tools, Azure Trial, the phone tools, and et cetera. You can download all the links from there. Um, but we'll just add a simple phone app. I'm going to even call it Phone App 1. Do you like the name? And we'll add it to this. Say OK. And what it does is it's going to create a simple XAML-based rendering of a phone UI. Now, typically, when I've got a phone application, I've got the main screen, which is going to have all of whatever my application does. I've got a splash screen to display when you come in. I'll probably have a separate screen to actually do the login. So what I would do is I would create a login screen and then handle the actual phone or the access control conversation at that point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the NuGet to actually generate some code for me. So if I take a look here, first of all, let's make that a little bit smaller. Bring this over here, and we'll give this a name. We'll call this Tech Connections 12.
TechCon 12. Um, in the phone app, in the library here, you'll see I just have just the simple stuff here, the main page, I've got an app XAML. Um, I'm going to go over here to where you've got your extension manager for Visual Studio. I'm just going to make sure that I've installed the NuGet package manager. If you haven't got it installed, just type in NuGet. It'll then search online for it, and then you can add install, and then you'll have to restart it. But then once it's been added, you're in good shape. By doing that, under the tools, I can go out and I can say, go to my library package manager, and go to the package manager console. This is then going to go out and initialize that for me. Um, and it's actually running PowerShell, which is going to take care of doing the assemblies and the pages and all the other pieces that it's going to add for me. Um, and then I'm going to go out and I'm going to make sure that I've selected the default project being my phone app. If you do it to the Windows website, it'll try adding stuff to it, but it's not going to hurt anything, but you really don't want to do it there. You want to actually put the NuGet package to the phone app. And then I'm going to run a command, and that command says install, it's not case sensitive either, install package, which is a PowerShell command that is going to be called phone.identity.access control dot base page. And this is going to add a base page to handle that login for me. And it's actually going to do that conversation. And it's going to do more than that. It's also going to add the assemblies I need to the project that gets deployed for the device. It's going to um, create the page, plus it's going to give me some documentation laying out all the different steps that I have to do to make this thing work within the phone. So there's the base page. Um, let it finish spinning through here. Adds the assemblies, adds the, uh, the, the dependencies, and then when that is done, it'll actually display how to use it. And then inside here is a bunch of instructions. The instructions are you know, a little bit lengthy, but I'll just walk through what happens. Up here in our project, remember that I had just the application and the base page. It added a folder for the README. That's where all the README text is. It's also added pages, and inside of pages, I have this login page. Example, it, that's new code. It just added to my page. Um, I can double click on that. I can take a look at it and customize it, add my Chrome, make it look the way I want it to look. I, I really like the, you know, the uh, developer art they used. Um, I also have some resources down here, and this is where I've got my access control XAML file, which is going to be added. It allows me to go out and use the binding piece to be able to tie in my namespace and the realm that we're running from. So our namespace, this would be my tech demo. Remember, it's mytechdemo.cloudapp.net. That is where this is all going to run. So I'm just going to put in my part of that, my tech demo, And then the realm is going to be URI, my RPA. And did I call it my tech demo or my tech demo 12? Is it tech demo 12? No, it's my tech demo. The site was tech demo 12. I, I was messing around with it. Um, and if you take a look at your relying party applications, you can see that that's the piece you need, is that information right there. Once we've done this, in the login page itself, there's a couple of pieces of logic that you have to change. One is it needs to have a way to navigate back to where it started. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here. I'm going to add a, a thing to navigate back to the correct page. So we'll do a control KU to uncomment that. And I'm going to just put this back to the main page, .xaml. And I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to paste that in down here as well. There's two to-dos that you have to go through. So um, the login page now knows how to redirect back to the main page after that authentication conversation has happened. Now all I need to do is come up with a way to trigger the login. To trigger the login, I could have it automatically open up and navigate directly to the login page. And in fact, the instructions in the document say to go do that. Um, I found that I like to have the main page sometimes come up, and maybe I want to log in, maybe I don't. So um, you could, from the main page, trigger that as well. So what I do, or what I've been playing with, is in my main page, is when I go out here and I say um, view code, is in the constructor, after I have gone ahead and done the initialized component, I'm going to go out and see if I have that token back from the access control services. And if I don't, then display the UI to get one. So let's add a little bit of code here. And what I've got is right here. 
or maybe I don't have it down here, I don't know. So I have some globals. And this has got my simple web token store, which is the uh, data type that was added by the, uh, the Windows Azure Identity sample, or the NuGet package added. So I've got an SWT store that's going to basically contain the information that comes back in that token. And then after I initialize component, it's going to go out and draw everything on the screen. Everything's going to exist. At that point, I'm going to go out and say, do we have a token? So I'm going to add after the initialize component here something to go out and say, guess what? Do we have a valid SWT store? And if we don't, navigate out to my login page. If we do, then go ahead and go down to login page, generate a method stub for that. And what we're going to do in this is I'm going to iterate through all the claims that come back, and I'm just going to put up a message box saying you're logged in. So let's add the code for that. So here's our claims. And what I'm going to do is for each claim in the simple web token, I'm going to pull out the claim name, and then I'm going to split it and find the last index to basically get the name, and then I'm going to put the value of the claim uh, into that, and I'll just show the message box saying you're logged in. So it says hello world. I mean, just basic stuff. Um, now, the other thing I'm going to do is on my main page is I do want to test this and I want to be able to log in a couple times. So I'm going to add an application button in the app bar on the bottom to allow me to display at least some mechanism to allow you to log back out. And what this is is it's just a little button that's going to be uh, on the bottom. You see the little circles down here. And so what I'm going to do is I'll add some code here for that. And that code is just going to say, just set that, just make sure the user wants to log out. And if they do, then go ahead and do the log out. You sure you want to log out? Yes. Simple web token is equal to null. Renavigate out to the login page. So a lot of code here we wrote, tons of code. Um, if I right click on this and I say debug start a new instance, what we should see is that now the phone running in the emulator should go out, it's going to display the splash screen, which is that picture of like the little uh, watch. So it's going to deploy the application. It's going to go out, it's going to draw my page, it's going to display my login page, initialize component, test connections, and it says you don't have a token, go to the login. And then from the login, I should see there's my Google Me, Yahoo, and Live ID. Pretty straightforward. All right. So let's take this another step. Suppose we change our minds about how we're running our applications, and all of a sudden, one of our identity providers, we decide we don't want to support anymore. So suppose we go out and we drop a, an identity provider. Suppose Yahoo goes away. So we delete it. And now if I go back over to my cloudapp.net, actually, let's do this, go to my cloudapp.net, sorry about that. First of all, let's go to this. I'm not even in debug mode, I'm just running the application. If I open up my phone app one, it's gonna go out, do the splash, do the login, and notice it's now finding out exactly what I currently have. So when I make changes to part one, I get it to flow through to part two. So if I go to tech demo 12.cloudapp.net and do the login, where I've got these two providers, I should now be able to see the same thing from the cloudapp.net if I go out and try to log in to presenters. It's also going to say I've got the two. So Access Control Services takes that identity conversation. It's a service that works for us. It's our bouncer. It's the one who's going to make sure that the people that are coming through are going to authenticate themselves with an existing pool of identity Existing identity, I'm not going to go out and create my own login database. I'm not going to be liable for it. It's going to save me a lot of work. It's easy to get this thing set up and get, get started with it. Um, you might be asking, wait a second, but what about you know, the whole thing with a login provider? You know, I had the membership provider. All I'd have to do is just say, you know, it'd go out and create the database for me and all the rest of that stuff. And I had membership information and other apps. You know, it's like um, you might have like account information. Does this access control services still work with the other providers? The answer is yes. It works just fine with like the profile provider, 
with the uh, role providers, what you can do, what it does is it will create a, the appropriate schema and store it in the same way that you would anywhere else. Um, in fact, on Benko Tips, if I go out to that and show you one last page, if you log into Benko Tips with the identity provider, you'll find that it's going to, um, when I do the authentication here, I'm actually capturing some identity information. So I click on Login. And let's go pick an identity provider we want to work with. Let's go ahead and log in with Google. Put in our account. Say sign in. And what I've got inside here is some extra information, like Twitter, your email, full name. If I go to demos and I go to demos profile plus ACS, um, this page is all JavaScript. It's all written out to just simply going through the sys dot, uh, dot identity, pulling back profile information. So I got Mike, you know, and whatever. If I log out and sign in with my Yahoo account, remember I didn't change this identity bouncer. I changed the one that we were doing the tech demo. Um, if I log in with this guy, then I would get some different set of information. Actually, let's go back and use the live ID. I'm logged in as Q -U Q -W -E -R. Notice I type it very quickly. Profile plus ACS. Um, you've got a bunch of other information. So the profile data is being captured per user and using the, pro the provider model continues to support everything. You can outsource your identity and leverage and take advantage of what ACS can do and you can do that by using the cloud. So it simplifies the way we work with identity. Um, we can conf configure our identity providers. We add the STS reference. We can use the controls. There's tools that are out there for working with this. Um, the key is that I can go out and download uh, all this information and get started today. Go out to BencoTips.com. I've got the links and resources from today's talk. I'll take the code that we wrote, upload it. You can go ahead and look at it, take it apart, see what works, what doesn't work. Um, I will remove the database connection string. I'm going to delete, drop the database after we get done anyway. So, um, so the presenters table is just kind of like a demo example. Um, you can check out the other webcasts that are part of the series by going out to Bitly S2 N Cloud. Um, and then to get the tools in the trial, go to Azure MB for the tools and go to Azure Trial MB to get the 90-day uh, free trial. If you have Azure Bene or MSDN benefits, you can turn this on and it's going to be perpetual. You can use the ACS control services, access control services, uh, cloud identity uh, to drive things. So, questions? Was that, uh, so when you download the <coughs> SDK for this and you have that .NET app, are you right out of the gate, simply installing your, your .NET app, you're extending the existing membership database, is that what you're doing there, or, or is it two separate? It's a different provider for authentication than what the membership provider, if you do forms, windows, or none, and this is, this is in, in .NET 4.0 it's called none, and it's going to use the ACS to do the identity. So maybe I misunderstood that. So now we need, in our app, we need preferences that we want to store in the user's profile. Membership yep. area. Uh, well, maybe it could be profiles, but uh, mm -hmm. how are you associating those two? Is that it's automatic? That's I guess that's. So I'm using so for Benko Tips, I'm using the actual pro provider model to give me profile information. I'm using everything just straight out of the box to do that. You could write custom code, your own model to capture specific information. One of the one of the challenges is a lot of people have more than one identity. I might have a, you know, a, a Minnesota driver's license. I might have a Wisconsin driver's license. You know, well, maybe I shouldn't have, but suppose I did. You know, is there, am I still the same person? You know, which one's valid? I don't know. But I mean, the thing is, is that if you have multiple identities and you want to associate that with an account in your application, that's a blog post I'm working on. But the provider model can give you ways to get to that. I guess I'm asking, we want to store a bunch of custom attributes in the memberships portion of .NET, yeah. our local profile. 
what are what are we seeing as far as referencing? How do we when you're when you're configuring the, the .NET memberships? Are you saying that the authentication uh, when you configure the authentication model? You're saying which token you want back, the name or whatever. Is that all you're bringing across to the membership site? That's all that's coming back. And then from there, it's up to you to specify what piece of information you want in the profile or some custom mechanism you want to use for, for managing your accounts. You could use a certificate for that, couldn't you? You could use a certificate for that. Other questions? Did you guys enjoy that? How much does that cost again after the trial period is over? So after the trial period is over, We'll charge, I believe it's $2 for 100,000 transactions, or it might be $1 for 200,000 transactions. I keep getting those confused. But if you go out to the Azure site and you click on the pricing, it'll show you exactly what it's going to cost. Um, so click down here. You can go to Features. I guess I should have done it from here. But you can go to Identity. And in here, it'll lay out exactly what it's going to cost, how it works. Um, pricing. So it's $1.99 for 100,000 transactions. And again, if you have like a mobile app and people are out there hitting it, 100,000 users, 100,000 logins, that's a high class problem. It's worth $2 in my mind. Thank you very much. Tech Connection Live, brought to you by Component One Ultimate. Download your free trial at componentone.com slash ultimate. It's easy to build everything, everywhere, with the right tools and resources. Component One Ultimate delivers just that. Whether you're a Windows, Web, or XAML developer, the Component One Ultimate Collection enables you to create any type of application. WinForms, WPF, Silverlight, ASP.NET Web Forms, MVC, Metro, Windows Phone, iPhone, Compact Framework, and even ActiveX. This comprehensive package not only delivers hundreds of .NET controls, plus powerful OLAP data analysis controls, it even includes SharePoint Web Parts, documentation and screen capturing tools, light switch extensions, and tools for ADO.NET Net Entity Framework and RIA services, plus Esri mapping controls, the most comprehensive controls available for GIS application development. Component One Ultimate, the ultimate collection of tools for software developers. Go to componentone.com to download your free trial of Component One Ultimate.